want to start this? I guess the traditional welcome to the inaugural yeah. uh, episode of Overrated. Overrated. I love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am James Flutie. I'm Michael Joseph O'Connor. And we're gonna just a couple of guys who love film. We're going to talk about film. We're going to interview people. And we're going to, I think, for the most part, we're just going to let people know stuff that's already out there that's amazing, that helped create what we know about film today and is, of course, highly overrated. Right. <laughs> Completely, 100% <laughs> overrated. <laughs> and I think I think one of the biggest things that I'm I'm excited about, and I think it's what, what we were talking about, is uh, stuff that I... Uh, for example, we were talking about doing Metropolis for its length, mm-hmm. and I have never, I've never seen it. It's one of those things that, yeah. you know, you see every college kid has a poster of it, but I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've never actually seen it. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, because I'm mostly busy watching Captain Ron, or uh, <laughs> you know, some, something to that extent. Captain Ron for the fifteenth time. Yeah, or Beetlejuice. Yeah, something to that extent. <laughs> so um, yeah. So- when Netflix first came out, they used to have people tell them what they liked and what they wanted to see. <laughs> yeah. And then they stopped doing that because people <laughs> lied. They would say like, oh, yeah, I want to watch this foreign film, these documentaries. <laughs> and then it's just clueless again. <laughs> and like, and I, I do legitimately think, like myself, that they are lying to themselves. They weren't trying to impress Netflix. Totally, totally. But like me, I go like, oh, I can't wait to watch this, you know, 20th. 1920s French film, and then I'm not. I'm, not. I'm going to watch the Red the Balloon. Film. Oh, but <laughs> but Big Trouble in Little China for the one yeah. hundredth time. But that is a classic. That's that true. is That's out true. there with any French film. Poor example ever made. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this week we uh, we watched Fritz Lang's M. Speaking of of Metropolis. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I guess I, what what I want to know is is what because it, it was your at your suggestion what what uh, what prompted that? Well, uh, I, I had just watched it recently, uh-huh. and I was pretty blown away by it. And a large large part of that was you know oftentimes when you sit down and watch uh, a very old film. I mean, this is just right after there was audio. Right. This is right after the end of silent film. Right. And you can appreciate it, but you're not really glued to the screen. You know, there's a slower pacing. Definitely. You're not like breathless at any point. M was a genuinely provocative film from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And you would have to do so little to make like a modern adaptation of this film. Right. It holds up so well. Right. Agreed. Um, yeah, and and then the more I started reading about it, it's just fascinating. Fritz Lang is fascinating. Peter Lorre is fascinating. The fact that they actually were shut down by Nazis. Yes. Uh, before production <laughs> is fascinating. Yeah, um, yeah. So, it. it uh, I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I actually watched it twice. Um, I, like you were saying, it, it to to redo it, it would. Still, it would ring so true at this very moment. It would be so of the moment if you redid it now, you know, because it is yeah, yeah. it is so paranoid. Mm-hmm. The whole, <laughs> I, yeah, all of all of the the paranoia, the hysteria, still fits. It's crazy. Um, one of the things that I found sort of interesting that still fits today is the way that they didn't want to let him get off on a uh, insanity plea, right? Or just talk, oh, then you end up in a sanitarium and then you're back out there. I guess they were still doing that in the third. Right. Like, I didn't, <laughs> like that was still some common way to get out of uh, paying for a crime. Although I, I have to say, like, I imagine they had a much nicer idea of what sanitariums were like in the 1930s. Yes. <laughs> like, just, oh, just go drink some OJ and sit on a balcony for a couple of years. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's sure a- that was a horrible, horrible existence. <laughs> it's electrocute, electrocute, electrocute. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just a couple electrodes to the brain, and then you're out of there. <laughs> if we're going by one floor of the cuckoo's nest, I mean, it was pretty horrible in 1972. Yeah, I can imagine it's what pretty it was horrible now. I've yeah. known some people to have to stay a night or two in there. Right, right. And like, I'm sure it's only gotten much better over the generations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the, the club med that is uh, a insane asylum for child murderers. <laughs> Which, in case. Our audience uh, hasn't seen it, yes. which is weird because you're going to get spoilers in this. Right, right. 
Um, well, it was it, it was made a hundred years ago. Almost. That's what I'm saying. Is a little, but I mean, I guess uh, maybe they haven't heard of it. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people. I hadn't. Who just getting in a film, you know, they don't know a lot about it. Uh, perhaps they don't want some somebody, like some professor, lecturing at them about the value of these films. They right. just want a good, a good movie. Um, you can definitely get that from them. And and if you like any noir. Uh, yes. Up until present day noir, this is where it started, and you can really see that he was he was a master of what he was doing, and it was very new what he was doing. Right, right. It uh, it's um, well, you know, let's uh, let's try and just to kind of get a feel uh, for for the look of it. Um, I'm going to try and uh, go here to my my screen, and uh, and I, I want to play the the scene where it's the people in the garden. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see if I can find it. This is what you were talking about when you said it might be too time consuming to do this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we can edit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Let's see here. Not live streaming. It's fine. Right. And I think, oh, and uh, we should, so, and you, you might be able to speak to this a a little more than I could, but um, Peter Lorre had to leave, leave Germany because of this. Um, now, originally what I read is that he had to leave because of this. Okay. But actually, this probably saved his life, the more I read, uh, because a lot of actors, directors, writers, philosophers were being pr- imprisoned and killed. But if you were famous enough, uh, the Nazis would actually warn you beforehand right. because they didn't want like a high-profile imprisonment on uh, uh, you know right away. Wow. And so it's actually reported that Goebbels himself – told peter lorry to leave really yeah well so i mean the moral of the story nazis not so bad (laughs) and that's been our show thank you so much right time (laughs) uh if it benefits them right they're not too bad people (laughs) (laughs) all right so i have this uh this scene with uh where the uh the mother is is realizing that her kid is missing um and i i i found this to be very uh (laughs) <laughs> very telling of the whole tone of the of the film let's let's check it out um, and this is again what we're talking about there we go That is a killer shot. Mm. Is so, I mean, you could watch uh, the Coen Brothers noir film yeah. to see so much taken from this. Totally. <laughs> Just in case there was any doubt that there's a child missing. <laughs> Is, is, uh, <laughs> There's a, a balloon little... and a ball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that that in- entire uh, that whole sequence is is really reminiscent of the whole movie. You know, it's 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 mm. uh, it's as far as showing and and not necessarily telling. Yes. Uh, also, uh, I, as I was reading in, in the. I can't claim to know so much about this era film that I would have noticed this otherwise, but he has a lot of silence. Yes. There are scenes with absolutely no dialogue, no music, Mm -hmm. no Foley art. It's just silence. And not a lot of people were doing that because audio had just been invented. All these directors felt that it's just noise, 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 noise. It's pretty, it was like CG in the (laughs) late nineties, you know, just, can we make a CG of the CG? Right. Right. Um, but he let it be silent, and it creates such a creepy, sad, desperate quality to the film. I think. I think. Is there is there any music in it? I mean, except for in the um, opening. It, interestingly, um, he created in this. This is the first use of a what's known as a light motif, uh-huh. which is the uh, presence of a character being denoted by music, which oh. is him whistling the oh, whistling. Uh, in the Hollow Mountain King. Right. That had never been done in film before. Interesting. So now we have 
that's ubiquitous now. I mean, like uh, Vader showing up to the Imperial March and Jaws theme happening when the, the shark's showing up. Uh, but that was the first time, and he actually took it from opera. Huh. So the... It was a tool. It's because right where whereas the well you know the, whereas the music becomes sort of a character in and of itself mm-hmm. where it's like this is <laughs> this is when this shows up I think like the Darth Darth Vader is the perfect example of that yeah 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 yeah. Um, yeah so that way he can sort of say the character's here and he doesn't even have to show him you right just hear that whistling in the background right uh, it's a great tool if you think about it because of how often directors have to fit as much information into a single shot as possible if they can avoid having to actually show that character and then go back and establishing shot uh it's i mean that was very very smart of him yeah it's uh it it really it gives it it cuts down on some of the things that you see so often one of my favorite uh (laughs) examples and i'm gonna you know in in space balls uh, is uh, is you know where Rick and contemporary of sure the absolutely you know uh, <laughs> um, what uh, there's a scene with uh, Rick Moranis you know where he is saying he gives out and you see it all the time in sci-fi you see it, 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 it once you notice it in any film it, it becomes uh, uh, almost irritating to see is where he explains the entire plot and as he's t- speaking to somebody else and then turns to the camera and goes everybody got that like drops all this <laughs> all this exposition you know because yeah. and once you notice that they do it fucking all the time in sci-fi it's it's, mm. it's crazy it's like well you know we have to blah 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 because the you know because of this like why are they explaining this to this there, other character there there is a, a you're right. It happens all the time in sci-fi. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's partially because sci-fi, you're presenting a completely other, different world. Right, right. And like physics and, and stuff like that so becomes... But I feel like a lot of the time they don't need to do that. And some producer showed up and went like, listen, no one's going to know what's going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I like, don't uh, get this. Dark City is a good example of yeah. that. They didn't want the narration in the beginning of the film, right. but some producer said, right. you have to explain things. Right. And I'm sure everyone there went, you know how movies work, right? Right. You figure right. things as they go along. <laughs> yeah. um, Blade Runner is another great example oh, yeah. of that. Uh, yeah. Apparently, Harrison Ford had to be dragged into the uh, studio to do the narration for that. God. Um, yeah, there's always the exposition is a fine way of doing it, but, but really I find like a lot of the really great directors just don't explain things. Sure. Just let the audience, uh, figure it out. Or if they can't figure it out, then it's this weird thing. Look at 2001. Yes. Kubrick didn't explain anything. Uh, yeah, no, no. That's... So what's with the weird obelisk? Why are things changing color? Because I said so. <laughs> and then guess what? There's a baby at the end. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and I think that, like like you were saying, using the music, um, it almost it presents, it gives that in uh, such a... Um, such a, a subconscious way because mu- people do respond to music so much. I know that I did, especially with that, with that song, that whistle, uh, that yeah. the whistling. Let's see if I can, f- let's take up a ton of time and, and find that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, it is, it is so, so visceral, you know, and, oh, yeah. and, and it doesn't, they did that. They did similar in the wire. The one character would whistle and that's how everyone in the neighborhood knew he was coming. Yeah, that's right. That's and they right. Hide. Yeah. That's right. And I remember that it, it really made the character seem pretty badass. When I right. That show. <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed that a lot. It might've been a direct reference to, uh, uh, to Fring in some way. Entirely possible. Um, one of the, the things I, I, I really, God, it's just, this whole thing is so unsettling. Um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of the of the whole of the movie itself, and um, how difficult it was for him to get it made, even even to yeah, begin he had with. a lot of he definitely had a lot of roadblocks. That's yes. for sure. More yes. than, I mean, once you add Nazis as a roadblock, right? That's more than your average roadblock. <laughs> yeah. That's, because like a lot of people, we're in development hell. There's a right. there's some copyright on one of the things we're, we have Nazis telling yeah. us how to make this. <laughs> now apparently they didn't want him to make it because the original title was called A Murderer Among Us. Uh huh. Okay. And they thought that meant Hitler. Right. <clears throat> right. And so they they said you know you can't make this movie. It's anti-Nazi. Right. And so then he had to try and tell them it's not anti-Nazi. And then he had to explain what it actually was, which didn't make matters that much better. 
Right. Going like, don't worry, it's not about Nazis, it's about a child murderer. <laughs> so then there was an uproar because it's about this child murderer. Right. <laughs> so that was that seemed to be the biggest issue he had. Uh, which I don't I don't know a lot of the ins and outs of that and how ultimately he got by it. Uh, he did change the, the the title, but according to uh, Lang, he changed it because he just thought it was a better title. He right. Just liked M. Right. Uh, and, um, it, you know, it's uh, and that's what I thought was so interesting about why he ran into so much um, trouble because it's got really it's nothing to, to do with Nazis, but it it kind of shows. I mean, at all, and and it it shows mm-hmm. how fucking paranoid they were about any sort of <laughs> <laughs> any sort of uh, um, you know what they would consider propaganda uh, against mm. them and, and it really it was just you know taking a, a bold stance of anti-child murder you know <laughs> <laughs> um, well now I did read one review mm-hmm. of, of M and they did point out that the cast as a whole with maybe the exception of, of a few including Peter Lorre are these rather unattractive people yeah and it also shows them in a very dark light. They're attacking innocent people. There's that paranoia going on. And that this was, in fact, uh, Fritz Lang, uh, his, he was talking about Nazi Germany mm-hmm. in opposed to what Germany was. Mm-hmm. So he's saying, like, look how disgusting we've become. Look how awful Berlin has become. Right. Uh, Fritz Lang himself was Jewish, and his wife actually joined the Nazi party. Really? Yes. Well, she helped him. Um, she wrote this with him. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the things that that we can sometimes forget is that in many ways, these political parties that come about start as that. They start as a political party. Yeah. So someone might be like, hey, I don't like the, the whole racism thing the Nazis got going, but I prefer their, their stance on e- expenses in the governmental right. area. You know, like there, there's very specific things. So she might have saw something in this party that was before they became what they are always going to be known for, which is the atrocities. Right. And, right. You know, what they should be known for. Right. right. Um, and I, I think it might have had something to do with that. Like she didn't necessarily have an animosity towards Jewish people, but at the same time, Fritz Lang was Jewish on his mother's side, but was raised Catholic. Huh. So maybe she just didn't really see him as Jewish. In fact, uh, there's a uh, a rumor that Goebbels offered Fritz Lang a position in the Nazi Party, really making films. Yes, and that Goebbels supposedly said, uh, "We decide who's Jewish and who's not." Wow. Yeah, That's, because they loved his movies, especially Metropolis. Yeah, right, right. I mean, well, it's, from what I know about Metropolis, it really is. Uh, it's just it's a it's pretty idyllic, as far as uh, you know, very efficient. So mm-hmm. so very German. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a place for everything, everything in its place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, and, and you know, not not to get too sidetracked, but my brother was telling me he's got a friend that uh, was raised in China. And um, when he came to the United States, he was telling my brother, uh, you know, it's just, it's too chaotic. And he was saying, you know, I, I really want to go back to China. There's order there. And huh. I think that's, that's really interesting that if you are raised in this kind of, you don't have to think about anything. You know, I, I can imagine that if you came back to if you came to the United States, you'd be like, it's fucking chaos here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I yeah, it's, I just I found that really oh, it's so nice. They wake you up. Yeah. Tell you what your job is. Right. Tell you how you feel about your job. Yeah. Tell you when to go home. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I don't know. What I, that... didn't, I spent two weeks. Didn't think once. <laughs> yeah. <Great. laughs> Best vacation I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> That's vacation making uh, something in like a turnstile. So I imagine like a, a 1940s factory right. conveyor belt going by. Well, I think um, there's a interesting, and here I'm going to try and find this. Uh, there's an interesting scene right at the end. Here, let's let's take a look at it. Yeah, the trial. I guess. Yeah, you know, it is so. I think 
rare. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that I'm a purveyor of a lot of foreign films, but I watch movies in general. A lot of them are foreign. Mm-hmm. When an actor can absolutely nail a monologue yes. in another language, right. and I'm floored at the end, I would say I can think of one other time that, that that's happened off the top of my head. What's what's the and other that's, time? Uh, Seven Samurai. Oh yeah, Akira Kurosawa. Mm-hmm. When that the one guy who's sort of posing as a samurai starts talking about what it's like to be a farmer right. and have samurais invade your village, that was amazing. So right. this and but Peter Lorre in this scene is fantastic. Right. Let's uh, let's try and find that here. It'll be another twenty minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know a lot of people point to this. And they say that that the beauty here is that Peter Lorre makes you sympathize with the character. Yeah. I can't say that I sympathize. I agree. Like I didn't. I didn't feel sorry for that character at all. But it gave you an understanding. Yes. So yeah. So like this isn't some one dimensional evil boogeyman. This is a tortured person. You don't feel sorry for him. Right. You know. Like, right. Oh, oh boo hoo! You're tortured. You know that, that there's no real empathy even for him there but you can you get an understanding of who this character is right totally let's see there we go Hier kommst du nicht mehr raus. Aber meine Herren, ich bitte Sie, ich weiß gar nicht, was Sie von mir wollen. Ich bitte Sie, lassen Sie mich doch frei. Das Ganze muss doch ein Irrtum sein. Ein Irrtum. Oh nein. Kein Irrtum. Ausgeschlossen. Das ist kein Irrtum. <laughs> what if we had those uh, signs today? <laughs> so apparently the, uh, the the network of beggars, uh-huh. you know, they, they go into that where they have the beggars look out for them and they're like a whole like community. That was an actual thing in Berlin back then. It's interesting. Yeah, they uh, they called it a beggars union. Yeah, that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that was really... Um, <laughs> You never, you would never see that today. I thought that yeah. was so interesting, like that. And they all kind of get together. There's a scene where the guys uh, taking like half stub like cigarettes, you know, mm-hmm. and, and laying them out, and it was it was wild, man. That that was a that was a thing that <laughs> it's like you would think, um, you know, if you put that much effort in to have a union, <clears throat> you know, you wouldn't have to be a beggar. But apparently, it was it, that's that's pretty pretty cush. You know, I, I once uh, applied for a job in a, a large uh, grocery store chain, mm-hmm. and they were unionized, and they made, it was 50 cents above minimum wage, Sure. and you had to pay union dues, and you didn't get health insurance for like a year. <laughs> um, what is your union doing? <laughs> <laughs> The aggressive union battles we've gotten you 50 cents that will go back to us. <laughs> People died. <laughs> There's a folk song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie. Gonna get you that 50 cents. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so that like the immediately when I heard like beggars union, I just. <laughs> 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 oh god yeah i mean and i think uh, i think that whole that whole scene I, i'm not sure if that little clip kind of uh conveyed it um but he truly uh doesn't seem to understand what the issue is here you know and i i think that um what you were saying is that it not necessarily that you feel sorry but it's mm. it's not necessarily sympathy that he brings on it's it's empathy Mm. You know, uh, yeah, definitely a feeling of understanding, but no remorse for him. Sure, right. Uh, Fritz Lang actually interviewed murderers for this. No he shit. Eight, yeah, he spent eight days uh, interviewing people, uh, including including various child murderers, and one in particular. People theorize that that who uh, the character in M is based on. However, he denied it later. Hmm. But 
yeah, he drew on heavy experience. And there were actually uh, criminals in the film. He, he, he had them as, as characters and extras. And there was something like 25 arrests at the end of rafting. No shit. This movie. <laughs> I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> oh, 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 let's just finish this shot first. Just, let's finish the shot. Holy shit. Okay. No, use the fear. Yeah. Use the fear yeah. that you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. It's really going to motivate this. Because you are, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's fucking crazy. I mean, it, 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 that, that speaks to, um, and, you know, trying to get that done under such a, um, you know, clearly sensitive and, uh, um, easily offended regime while also interviewing actual murderers, you know, that's, that's some wild shit. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and really it's, sh- it shows in the, in the tone of, of the whole movie. It, it, it also shows how uh, insane Fritz Lang seems to be. Yes. Not only dedicated, mm-hmm. but also crazy. Right. Uh, he was apparently, actors hated working with him because he was just uh, cruel. Right. Uh, he did really mean things. And I think we're going to watch other Fritz Lang films, so I mm-hmm. can probably say some of the stories that I've read. But in this one, he dropped Peter Lorre down the flight of stairs that he falls. Yeah. Like, little, like 15 times. Really? And like, yeah, and like Peter Lorre would not work with him again. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not the only actor. There's like, it seemed about half or more of the actors he worked with would never work with him again. Wow. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, that's the, that's the dedication, I guess. That's what you gotta do. <laughs> do whatever you can to get the shot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's. It's interesting, like uh, that. You know, that straight up insanity. You're bringing up Stanley Kubrick. I had I'd read a little while ago that, um, uh, you know, if you watch The Shining, there are some. Shelley Duvall is like one of my favorite actors. I've always had kind of a thing for Shelley Duvall. My wife kind of looks like Shelley Duvall. Just saying. And uh, there's a uh, there's throughout that entire movie, she looks and acts fucked up. You know, and, and apparently mm-hmm. I had read some things that Stanley Kubrick was just horrendous to her mm-hmm. to get that that kind of look from her. She looks miserable. And I wonder if, you know, to someone outside, you know, so doing something like throwing Peter Lorre down a flight of stairs, although hilarious, um, you know, that's that's who who is that for? I mean, ultimately the audience, but um, to, to yeah, have I would. I would argue that as much as I love film, Mm -hmm. it's never worth it. Right. Like I love art, but there are plenty of artists out there making great films that don't have to torture anyone. Right. Right. Um, Now that to be said, I could never tell someone like Fritz Lang or Stanley Kubrick not to do or how to do their job because they're masters of their field. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like you need to be a terrible person to do this job. Right. You could choose not to be. Right. Um, the, the, you know, another great example of that is the, the director of, uh, the exorcist, oh, yeah. he just screwed up the, uh, the, the woman who played the mother and I know, I know her name. I can't off, remember. Off my head. I Will, can't William, but, Fr- William Friedkin's the director that much. I know. Yeah. And he, uh, caused her immense pain for the rest of her life. And she had a back surgery because they hooked her up to this device so that when she gets thrown across the room, right. It pulls her away. And she said, it's on the lowest setting, right? And he was like, oh, yeah, we're going to speed up the film. And then he secretly turned up the setting. That's fucked up. And so it just whipped her across and caused, like, spinal damage. Of course. Of course it did. (laughs) (laughs) Now, since we did just show a piece of Peter Lorre there delivering, his performance in this is amazing. Mm -hmm. His performance, uh, the first time I was ever blown away by him was in the Maltese Falcon. Yes. And... He it's so interesting that he is this phenomenal actor. And I mean, I think if if given the chance, he could have been like like Brando. I mean, just he could have blown people away, not in that rugged, attractive and still amazing way. But but in that he was pushing forward acting. Brando was at that time giving this real naturalistic way of acting that we see a lot more now. And I think Peter Lorre was doing that. In a way, his his delivery seemed a lot more natural than mm-hmm. uh, in comparison to a lot of other actors. But 
you know, slowly he became the horror guy. Yeah. He was given all these goofy roles right. because of his goofy face and, and voice. <laughs> <laughs> all because of his dumb face. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> that's the name of my autobiography. <laughs> the, the James Flutie story, all because of my dumb face. This is you on the fucking fret. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to call it this. Um, I like, I like how you did the like the classic like comedy bio cover from the eighties. Like, here I am. Uh, Kelsey Grammer wrote a book. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I wonder because it's there was. Um, uh, Marlon Brando and James Dean and I think Al Pacino all went to the same um, uh, acting school. I forget. It, it escapes me what it is. And um, it was definitely the, I think it's called the Meisner technique where it's all about mm-hmm. listening and um, and reacting as, a, as opposed to pushing forward your... Um, your, your uh, pr- projection of, of how you're supposed to be feeling. It's about f- taking in the other person's um, mm-hmm. thing. And mm-hmm. I think that's where a lot of that naturalistic kind of acting where you're right. Mm-hmm. We see it all the time now. Um, but uh, especially in that monologue that he does at the end, it's uh, mm-hmm. there's nothing to react to. And he's really, mm-hmm. like you said, um, uh, pushing out some kind of, humanity to a murderer he's bringing he's bringing humanity to it and then that's really really impressive uh yeah and i mean uh, from here he went on to well from here he fled germany right he went to england and couldn't find any work for a long time and then hitchcock uh sees him in m and wants to cast him for a uh, man who knew too much right now what's interesting is uh peter laurie didn't speak english Really? And so he has this meeting with Hitchcock, but he says, someone tells him that Hitchcock loves to talk. <laughs> and so he just let Hitchcock talk the entire meeting and would just laugh. That's amazing. To his stories. And so Hitchcock thought he could speak English. Wow. <laughs> and he cast him in this. And so he had to learn phonetically. Right. And then he had to learn what those phonetic, the words he had learned phonetically meant. And then he, so his acting isn't, in my opinion, the best in The Man Who Knew Too Much, but knowing what I know now, Pretty impressive. it's still phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, he could barely, he didn't know probably a third of what he was saying, like the true meaning behind them. Right. That is crazy. I wonder when he, um, when he eventually did learn English, because, like, when was Casa- Casablanca, that would... Casablanca, that was like third... I think he left, I think he left Germany in 1933. Right. And then he went on the man who knew because he had Casablanca came a little while later right. because he went to the United States. He started doing uh, some of the monster movies and like goofy stuff like that. And then Casablanca was sort of a resurgence for him, and that's when he started working with Humphrey Bogart. Right. Um, I was Casablanca. I think Casablanca was after uh, Maltese Falcon. I'm, I'm gonna that that seems right to me. Yeah, yeah. So that, I can't remember what year that was, but um, I mean, he, he apparently picked up English very quickly. Right, right. Yeah. Huh. I mean, that's, you know. I mean, look at that body of work. It's crazy. It's like Casablanca, Maltese Falcon, M, The Man Who Knew Too Much. I mean, he's in some of the, some of the, the iconic films of that time. And he's not really seen as, as a, I mean, not as like a leading man. <laughs> you know, but he's yeah. not really seen as as legendary as when you when you think when you sit down and think about all of the things that he's been in. I mean, I guess would you describe mm-hmm. him as a character actor now? Like, would he be like yeah, an that ape, is, ape that pagoda? That is generally how he's described as one of the best character actors. Right. In, 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 which character actor always seemed like a weird, like like genre like a character actor? What is that? Oh, you're just you're ugly. Yeah. Like yeah. you, so you look like, like you're an actor or you're just an ugly actor and we call you a character actor. You look like Brian Dennehy. <laughs> that, that story of Patton Oswalt. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> character actors. You have to work that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> it seems like, I guess the, the concept is supposed to be that you play the strange character to the left of the leading man. Right. And that the leading man is so often this every man. But that just also makes Hollywood and film in general sound so boring. Doesn't it? 
you know, that they, you know, yeah. like the leading man is often a very interesting character. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, or are we always making 20,000 leagues under the sea or are we always yeah. making Maltese Falcon and, 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 you know, right. Yeah. You're the, uh, you're the, the Wilford Brimley to, uh, to the Steve Gutenberg and cocoon, which I just watched the other day, you know, I mean, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's a very quick, yeah. uh, remembrance of all those after names. <laughs> Which you know, let's let let us not forget uh, a time when Steve Gutenberg was considered a, a leading man. Um, Steve Gutenberg has done a few acting choices since then in television, and he, he's still a leading man to me, dude. That dude is hilarious. <laughs> is he really? I love him. He was in a uh, Party Down by <laughs> oh, yeah, himself. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, and he was in Community playing like some like like. Uh, Questionable producer. Oh, I don't, and I, I don't like, remember that. That's funny. Need to get him back on top. <laughs> okay. All right. I didn't know this was such a. I didn't know you're such a guten. Sorry. Head. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sensitive issue. Such a guten head. I'm sorry I'm about that. Tired of people <laughs> ragging on the G man. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, okay, so it, look, it says here Casablanca was uh, in 1942. Okay, so, so he would have been. Um, yeah, well, yeah, that is a, it was shortly before the end of the war, mm-hmm. and it really seemed that that was the end of Peter Lorre being able to make the movies he wanted. Right, because no one wanted mystery and thrillers after the war. It all became westerns. Interesting, really. And so that's that's you know sort of the beginning of when he started working with Vincent Price and Bela Lugosi, right. and and then after that started doing Disney movies, like a lot of family films. Well, he did do like Two Thousand Leagues Under the Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, right? Yeah. Huh. Um, and then later, of course, you know he passes away, and now we just resurrect his character and put him in this. Kids film. Yeah, right. I mean, it's he kind of has the um, the same thing that you always see, like uh, Orson Welles always mm. kind of parodied in in kids yeah. film because it's such a uh, a tough impression to do. But but you know, it's it's an easily uh, characterized, very very, mm. very easily characterized. You know, I mean, I, you know, it's it's almost unfortunate. Although really, the reality is, you can be an incredibly good actor. I mean, just amazing and never make it. That's right. that's the reality of it. I'm sure not a lot of people want to hear that. <laughs> right. I have to tell people that what? all the time. <laughs> There's some guy. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> no, as long as I work hard at a chef. Stop, stop, nope, nope, no. nope, nope. Go home. But, <laughs> you know, but it is almost unfortunate that he was so unique in his voice and his appearance and his facial expressions because that's what ended up in many ways getting him typecast as much as his brilliant performance in M mm-hmm. made him typecast in horrors and, and creepy films. It was those eyes. Yeah. That way of talking, the yes. breathy German accent, right. you know, um, because he probably could have done a lot more than what he was given. Uh, I do want to see, he was willing to make a movie about a man who puts uh, murderers hands onto a penis body. Yeah. And then they kill people. Right. So he did that movie right. in order to make, uh, what was it, um, Crime and Punishment. Oh, shit. So apparently he's the main character in a, a version. And although critics enjoyed it, it was a flop. No one, and, and again, it was because, uh, according to some, no one was ready to see him as a leading man, which, again, I still find very strange. That is strange, right. Yeah. Right. Like, the, just the idea that, ah, oh, he's kind of chubby. I don't want to watch some guy on the screen. That's a really weird... Uh, I don't know if it's even an American thing. It does seem to be. Well, you well, look at some of the leading men in other countries, and you're like, really? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Why can't we have that here? Why can't weird? We have like two weird looking actors that are leading men ever. Uh, <laughs> Seth, Seth Rogen. <laughs> uh, Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi. Oh, God bless Thank Steve God Buscemi. For Steve Buscemi. God bless him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I. I thoroughly enjoy this movie. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I, I'm curious as to maybe, maybe you would know where it falls as, as far as I had not even thought of it as a, as noir. And that, mm-hmm. that, that in and of itself is kind of a, a term of, um, some, uh, some, some debate because as opposed to whether it's a genre or a look, um, but now that you you mention it, it, it is very uh, noir. As, yeah. But I wonder if it's also just very German. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, according to you know a lot of things I read, a lot of people do consider it the first noir film. No shit. Okay. 
Yeah, and that it set the precedent for the genre. You know, uh, I almost feel uh, terrified to, to to say anything about noir because there is such a like. It's almost like the term um, ironic. Right. Everyone has a different idea of what that means. Right. Right. And what is and isn't noir, what isn't and isn't ironic. Right. Uh, Landis Moore said has made a song about both. <laughs> uh, but like, you know, a lot of what people point at in noir is that dark, bleak atmosphere, right. the quiet atmosphere, the paranoia mm-hmm. is a, a thing that runs through a lot of noir Tension. films. And this definitely has that. Yeah. Uh, conspiratorial conversations <laughs> in a smoky room right. with a bunch of uh, like old guys, you know, that, that seems very, uh, detective noir right. kind of look to it as well. Right. Yeah. I, um, I wonder because, you know, if you watch like any of the, uh, earlier stuff, like of like Werner Herzog, um, mm-hmm. you know, which is just about as, as German as you're, you're going to get, you know, it's, um, you know, I think of, <laughs> I mean, obviously, what's Mike Myers' old like Saturday Night Live character, Dieter? You know, but, <laughs> you know that all oh, lots of gears and I, you know, so much of that probably was. Mm-hmm. Again, I haven't seen. I've seen clips of Metropolis, but so much was taken of that, of what people think of like German cinema is is that you know like uh, very, mm-hmm. very industrial. Um, yeah. You know, and and the booking man's heart breaks as he works the night. Away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the kids in the hall parody that a lot. You know, <laughs> we were proletariat shall never. Never dream again. Right. <laughs> you know, um, and, and this, this definitely has that. I think in that scene we showed earlier where she's um, looking for, where, uh, the mom's looking for the kid and just the ball that rolls, the empty seat at the table. Um, and like you were talking about, there's not a whole lot of, of music aside from the whistling and not a whole lot of Foley mm-hmm. art, a lot of silence. I wonder how much of that is just kind of from the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and a direct response to people using so much sound. Um, yeah. You know, and it may, it makes you wonder to like to sort of point at that and say the first noir or just maybe pointing and look how much German cinema mm-hmm. has influenced this genre. Right, right, right. It must, it, it must be because have noir is a response uh, to German cinema. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, someone on my phone is coming all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, James. It's not your fault. Um, <laughs> it's not your fault. Now a reenactment. <laughs> <Yes. of> the- <laughs> <laughs> Stay. <laughs> well, I um, yeah. I mean, like I say, I I, I thoroughly enjoyed enjoyed this movie, and um, I'm looking forward to what's the other one? Not Metropolis, but what's the other Fritz Lang one that you wanted to do? Uh, he's got the uh, the Doctor Mabuse. That's what it is. That's what it is. Uh, he's got another one. I think it's called either like Justice or Jealous. Or I, I'm forgetting the, the Liberty. Right. I'm forgetting the title now. Um, now, what I would like to do, mm-hmm. and we'll probably have to edit this part out. Sure. This is a little breaking up a fourth wall. But uh, is every month when we're doing this is pick their worst film as Ooh. well. Yeah. So that way we can sort of go like, here's you know, here's the them at the low point, or right. you know, like even though they're a genius, look at what you know comes out. Because uh, so his worst film is generally it seems to be considered Fury. Okay. Which I believe might actually be like the Brad Pitt movie is a remake of that. Is it really the tank movie? I, I think just because I read the description, huh. I haven't seen the new one. But um, let's see. Yeah, the thousand eyes. The result of thousand eyes of Doctor Mabuse, which was in 1960. He lived quite long. He did. I think in the 70s. Yeah, and I think a Fury was made in the 60s. Um, but he, there's actually about three or four Doctor Mabuse. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah, and I think it's like the testament of Doctor Mabuse that is supposed to be is the the better of those. Gotcha. Uh, Fury is a uh, cri- uh, crime film, so it doesn't seem to be um, the Brad Pitt. Oh, you not- know what? I think I think whatever site had had misplaced. Right. They they heard the name Fury and then just okay. Right. So well, I'll have to find a more credible source. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's, it's interesting. And one of the things that I, I've read about, about Fritz Lang and, and t- certainly ties into what we were talking about as far as how he kind of embodies what we think of German, 
uh, films is, you know, once he moved to America and started making, you know, started making films that he, he almost doubled down on the geometric shapes, the, the really dark, um, lighting and things like that, which kind of maybe kind of secured his legacy as ma- making that kind of, kind of thing. Um, mm. I, I think that's, that's interesting. Like, it, you know, this isn't what you're used to. And, you know, this was in, he, he moved, let's see, when did he move to Hollywood in 1936? Um, yeah, he became a naturalized citizen of the United States in 1939. And yeah, he worked, he made 23 features in America. Um, mm. and, uh, oh, he made, okay. He made Be- beyond a reasonable doubt. Have you ever seen that? That's definitely like, uh, no. definitely like, a f- I, d- I didn't realize he even made that. That's definitely a, a sort of what we think of currently as, as noir. So I wonder, yeah, if, okay. if he, if he really did have, have that much influence that mm-hmm. it became almost, you know, when you talk about, when you, t- when you think about noir, that kind of the hard boiled detective, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he kind of did in- invent that. And I would have loved to see him work with Peter Laurie more in that kind of, genre yeah if only fritz lang hadn't been a sociopath sure sure (laughs) (laughs) like so many talented people before him yeah i know hey we both know we both know um (laughs) the impressive thing about uh peter lorry as well uh to go back to him Mm -hmm. uh he did all these great performances and was addicted to uh, morphine mm. like the entire time. Nice. He got uh, surgery on his back when he was younger, and they gave him morphine as a prescription for the pain, and he's, he never stopped. Really? And so, like, he was, uh, like, his friends and family knew about it, but no co workers ever did, and he still brought in these amazing. What an old timey addiction to have. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ether. <laughs> <laughs> No one's addicted to morphine. <laughs> no one gets. I go down to the corner store and get myself a morphine fast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the dirigible. <laughs> big bicycle with the big wheel. <laughs> <laughs> big front wheel. And... Spinning. By the way, maybe we we can uh, we can post that that image I shared with you of the guy's uh, yeah. pipe. Oh yeah, yeah. It let's looks like Bill burned it. Here, let's see. <laughs> So it looks like you cut a cigar and then place it like face up right. in this weird pipe. And it, and it shows him smoking it for like, it's like a 10 second shot. It's like just him smoking this pipe right. while other people are talking. Here, I can find it. Let's see. Because it's amazing. It's, <laughs> there it is. It's such an amazing, uh, like, why? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um Oh, come on, you. (laughs) Yeah, there it is. All right, here. We'll edit this out. Uh, We we won't. We won't edit this out. We'll just keep it. (laughs) This is going to be a four-hour long podcast. (laughs) That'll just be so... Mostly shut places. (laughs) Yeah, there it is. (laughs) There we are. Now, to me, what that looks like is a guy thinking, well, I've got a high ceiling, but a very short room. Right. (laughs) <laughs> so if I could just have my pipe go up, <laughs> it's like the original steampunk. Yeah, seriously, seriously. <laughs> Put some goggles on him, <laughs> top hat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh man. Um, well, you know, I I gotta say we're 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 close we're close to an hour. We we did it. Yeah. Um, we did. Yeah, I. I, I usable. Yeah, I, I, I'd say a good fifteen minutes is usable. Nice. Yeah, that's the, that's the attention span most people have. Right. <laughs> um, hold on. Let me. You know what? I got to yell at my dog. Give me. Give me a second here. All right. Okay. This has to stay in. All right. Sorry. He was barking at the mailman. Don't way to be <laughs> stereotypical. Poor mailman. Yeah. What did he ever do? Um. Yeah, I think uh, which so which one do you want to do next? I think uh, Metropolis. I'm down. I'm so down. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, join us uh, next week. Any listeners that we have, uh, I'm sure there won't be many on the first episode. How many times are you that lucky? Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> but we'll, you know, uh, if you got any questions, anything you want to point out that we should have brought up. I will uh, also let us know if there are any artists or concepts you'd like to be seen done later. Yeah. Right now we're doing Fritz Lang, but we're going to do other directors, other writers, cinematographers, maybe. Yeah. Also maybe themes, you know, let us know. Yeah. I, um, I'll set up a Facebook page and then, uh, yeah. we'll definitely have that. So, uh, um, let's, uh, let's, let's keep it going. I'm so, I'm so into it. Thank you for, uh, letting us discuss with you. One of the greatest, uh, foreign films possibly greatest yep. film ever yep. and also incredibly overrated so and overrated i just i just you know what it's just, it's too overrated <laughs> <laughs> that's the, again to re to reiterate one of the greatest films ever made yeah completely overrated I mean, of course, of course. <laughs> All right, everyone. So for uh, for for overrated, I'm Michael Joseph O'Connor, James Flutie, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>